So I just had two other um, very practical real world uh, studies that are being run, not through the Alliance Lung Committee, but through some of the other ancillary committees, but, but have a, um, a strong thoracic surgical role. So the first study I wanted to go through is just uh, Roberto Benzo's uh, study of preoperative uh, pulmonary rehabilitation before lung cancer resection. So there's a long history behind this. We ran a pilot at Mayo originally through Roberto. He's a pulmonologist there. Um, got some data, put some patients on study, had a paper that was sort of the pilot data for all of this, and then tried to run this uh, through an R01 that he had through a, a limited number of other centers, but were really plagued with accrual issues and trying to get this done. And so it was subsequently um, through NCI's request um, lopped into the Alliance inbox and um, we were basically asked if we could run this through the Alliance network in order to try and increase uh, accrual. It's, it's still struggling somewhat. Um, the, the basic schema looks like this. Um, so basically anybody coming for a lung cancer resection um, who has a, a medical diagnosis of COPD um, can get randomized to either getting 10 sessions of uh, preoperative pulmonary rehabilitation over a two-week time frame um, versus nothing, and then go to surgery with a view towards looking at uh, postoperative pulmonary complications and other complications as, uh, as an endpoint. Um, so you got to be over 18. Um, we originally started with this with some very, very strict criteria as to what the, um, the pre-op PFTs um, would be, which is really the the real world scenario where you're struggling as to whether or not this patient would really benefit from uh, preoperative rehab or not. And this has been relaxed to a degree now that it's, it's maybe even a, a question mark as to whether it's fully valid. But all you have to do is just have a medical diagnosis here of COPD. There's no PFT requirement to it whatsoever now. Um, they have to undergo a lung cancer resection for a lung cancer. Um, they have to be a current or ex-smoker with a smoking history of more than 10 years and then be willing to be randomized and be motivated to do the rehab sessions. We've tried to scale this down to as small a time frame as you really can and still have it be meaningful. So that's where the 10 sessions over two weeks uh, comes from. Um, and then the endpoints are, um, you know, a number of post-operative pulmonary complication measures like pneumonia, atelectasis, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then a number of uh, quality of life uh, breathing-oriented uh, questionnaires that are going to be done at the back end. I think one of the complicating things here is, has been that the this isn't just garden variety pulmonary rehab. This is sort of Roberto's you know, rehab plan, so all the sites need to be credentialed and be trained by him and his group in order to be able to participate uh, in the study. Um, there's six sites live currently. I think even at Mayo, we're not currently live again just because of the bureaucratic issues of shutting it down and then opening it again as an alliance study. Um, but there's a targeted enrollment of 194 patients that we're going to need a lot more than just six sites live in order to really be able to do this. I know there's some people in the audience who have participated in this either as the, the smaller pilot group or have either tried to open it and then couldn't open it for various reasons. I'd certainly be interested. Do you want to speak to your experience, Linda? And, and if anyone else wants to comment, I'd love to hear the feedback so we can get it back to, to Roberto. Yeah, we um, tried to open it quite a while ago, and there was some issue that, like, it wasn't necessarily open to everybody to enroll, that there were some sort of criteria for having your site approved. And I've never been able to get to the bottom of it, but my team's really good at making these things happen, and they ran into roadblocks with opening it. I don't know if you've ever heard from Roberto what the story is with that. Uh, not, not a completely straight answer, no. <laughs> Does anyone have this study open who's in the audience? Chris, do, do you want to comment on it? Yeah, sure. We just, we just went live literally three or four days ago. And so we finally got through all the uh, training for our people who will be doing the rehab. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting study. The thing that um, I see as the biggest roadblock is probably the two-week waiting period, the minimum two week waiting period, most of our patients are in the OR within a week. So that mm -hmm. may be different in different places, depending on the local environment. Um, but, you know, to let a patient wait two week, weeks, um, oftentimes makes the patients nervous, isn't necessarily the best business plan. And so that's where I see uh, problems, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
transportation issues it's hard to get them to pulmonary rehab ten times every day for two weeks and the compliance is hasn't it's harder I mean we haven't tried to be will try to be a part of this but that's what it, one of the barriers for us is mm -hmm. Matt did you have your hand up back there too so we were uh, enrolled under the NCI and now we've just um, we had some issues with when we transitioned to Alliance so there was a break and we just started again I think yesterday we just got approval for that the um, one of the things differences between Alliance now and before is they used to pay they had a stipend for a daily stay at a hotel yes um, which is no longer there yeah so that was good because patients got some incentive to stay locally for the five days a week times two mm -hmm. but it's no longer there yeah when we were running it as a small consortium off the r01 that roberto had there was money in the budget there so that um we could pay parking and hotel stays and stuff like that but obviously nci got rid of that when it became a cooperative group study dennis how do you, how do you get your center credentialed for the rehab um, through through Roberto so just let us know there, so there's a mechanism now through the Alliance that um, it, it's part of the credentialing to be an open uh, center for the study um, so you can go through that mechanism or just reach out to myself or, or Roberto and basically what he does is comes down and visits goes through the training um, and then signs off on you being able to deliver your rehab group being able to deliver the recipe Yeah. And then found out that the uh, that the rehab has to be delivered on site. Our rehab is delivered off site, and that was a deal breaker. Hmm. Okay, I hadn't heard that one before, but really, let me get that feedback back to Roberto then too, because really, there's no practical reason why it would have to be delivered on site as long as it's still being delivered by people involved with the study team. I think the intent was well, you just couldn't to do it has to do with credentialing and him supervise or, or, or the, uh, the supervision of the the the, the exercises etc that, that that are necessary in other words the quality control was the issue mm -hmm. uh, and I assume this is not patients that are on neo adjuvant treatment because because that would be interesting because they're already coming back to you for the neoadjuvant treatment so they'd be there for that and additionally sometimes they get beat up a little bit by the neoadjuvant treatment so yeah no your subsequent study i guess <laughs> yeah I, I mean it's it's another great example like the stable mates one of you know a great idea something that there's a lot of surgical hand waving about but we don't really have great data but then boom we actually get a trial in place and then there's all kinds of hurdles in terms of actually people putting patients on study and getting the, the trial done so I, I would echo that you know we have problems with getting patients rehab outside because um, most of our patients don't get it at Hopkins they get it within the community I was wondering if there are, if, if you've added some of the newer technology like Fitbits and such there's a, there's a handful of either prospective or retrospective data from small institutions saying that <clears throat> they're able to monitor their patients during the prehab is there a way to add that because I think that would be sort of interesting and maybe give them a goal um, you know personally yeah no no I agree with you I mean the the space for all those technologies is moving so quickly that there's a lot of really really interesting stuff that will allow you to be able to have some connection with your patient and monitor what's happening remotely um, but for this the protocol is locked down I mean the ability for us to pivot and, and incorporate those other elements now would be uh, would be a big deal but I do agree with you. The idea that you know you have an iPhone app and it's linked to your Fitbit and you're measuring how many steps a patient is taking either in the pre-op setting or the post-op setting with all the other information that can be tacked into that is is definitely coming. That that is something we just need surgical involvement in order to have something that is useful for us and what we need and what we want. So, um, is there a way that you could incorporate the uh, prehab uh, during? The, the workup for the patient. So, so you know, sometimes you'll see the patient if, uh, as a lung nodule, as opposed to already with a decision made to go to surgery, and maybe, maybe capture them during that phase where they're getting some 
additional testing and coming back backwards and forwards to the hospital to get their, you know, whatever scan they're going to be doing and maybe link the prehab uh, during that period. And you may lose some patients who ultimately don't end up going to surgery, but that might be a way that you can, you know, uh, make it more palatable to patients. Yeah, you could. Yeah. I, I think in our place that, that doesn't really help because it, 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 it's not like there's a you know a big many week time lag where there's a bunch of testing going on that that we're waiting for but if people are in a situation where you could potentially enroll someone up front even without all the treatment decision making being made um, you can still meet those initial criteria without that all being locked down right now I, I'm just saying it as a way to get other sites involved uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you're trying that you're trying to get incorporated into the study. There may be a way of, may, may be a way of tackling that. Okay, all good feedback, thank you. And then the other um, study that has been, um, you know, talked about within the Alliance and even, you know, back into ACASOG days for a long, long time is this whole issue of, of active interventions in order to um, help people stop smoking prior to surgery. And I give a ton of credit to Ivana Krogan and, and Jeff Sloan, who just kept banging their heads against the wall to try and come up with a, a protocol that um, NCI would actually agree to. And that's now culminated in this study that is, that is now live. So this is Ivana's and Jeff's alliance study um, with the goal of trying to reduce surgical complications in newly diagnosed lung cancer patients who smoke cigarettes is the title. And then the primary objective of this is to try and see if uh, veronicline or Shantex, when you add it to a behavioral intervention, um, makes any difference in terms of post-surgical uh, complications through 24 weeks after surgery. So just to simplify that on the, on the schema, so the way this looks like is basically anybody who's smoking, who's coming for lung cancer surgery, um, everyone would get a, a standardized no smoking message and you have to sit through a bunch of webinars and so on in order to be you know, certified that you're gonna deliver that in a, in a um, consistent manner. Um, and then the patients from there get randomized to either get uh, renaclean for up to 12 weeks, um, in addition to the NCI tobacco quit line and the behavioral intervention versus no varenicline. Um, and then they're gonna be observed for surgery following that uh, for up to 24 weeks. So the, the important thing from a surgical standpoint, let me just go to this first. So um, it, the, the key window that's important for us is that there has to be at least a, a 10 day gap from the time that they get randomized to the time to surgery. So for them getting any kind of intervention, whether they're in the renaclean arm or not, you've gotta have at least 10 days go by before you can operate on them. You can go up to 12 weeks, which seems inordinately long, but, but that's the window within which um, you can actually operate on the patient um, from the time that they've actually been randomized. So you've got a minimum of a 10 day delay prior to surgery. And just to go back to some other details, so the, um, the patients will be randomized one-to-one -one, uh, between the two groups. The intervention group, again, participants will get varenicline plus the, the no smoking message from the surgical team and then behavioral support through the NCI quit line. And then the control group is just um, all of that but minus the, uh, the Shantex. Um, the teachable moment training, so Yvonne and Jeff have tried to put a lot of work in order to have some consistency around what the message is that's being delivered, because that's also an important part of the trial here, that there's some consistency in the no smoking message that gets delivered during that, that critical teachable moment of the surgical consultation. Um, so again, there's some webinars and some other things that you have to go through as part of the, the training for the study. Um, the targeted enrollment is 626 patients. Um, I don't know if, uh, as of when I was making these, I didn't know what the reimbursement actually was, but I can get that information to anybody um, who needs it. Um, in terms of surgical complications, this is a lot of standard, you know, ACS, NISQIP type stuff in terms of um, post-operative complications. And then those are gonna be followed up to a total of 24 weeks after the, the study, in addition to whether or not um, PISH Patients have really stopped smoking. Um, so a couple issues with the study, just to update people on, because it's sort of basically going live now. Um, one was there was an initial plan to try and stratify based on the operation being done. 
And this sort of got lost in the weeds in trying to come up with a, a meaningful um, stratification just to ensure that you didn't have you know, one group that were all complex pneumonectomies and another group that were all vatslobectomies. But at the end of the day, it really was not practical or feasible in order to be able to make this work. And the final decision was we were just going to get rid of the stratification completely. It's going to be analyzed at the back end, but people are going to be randomized as all comers. Um, the other issue that's come up, so there's, there's a bunch of correlative studies looking at salivary samples for a bunch of measurements as to, um, you know, how much someone is smoking and um, whether or not they've really quit, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the little, the kits to do that were just offered through one specific company that I know some sites were having issues w from a contracting standpoint because I think they were being sold by Fisher and if your institution didn't have a Fisher contract you couldn't get access to them or something like that. The, Yvonne is working to sort all that out. If anybody hits that hurdle as part of trying to open the study just let us know and we'll do our best to try and get that resolved. Um, and then the other issue that came up um, Rishi, you had emailed me just, do you want to just speak to that quickly? Um, is this whole issue of, of can you do everything at one visit or do you have to have a time lag from initial consultation to the time of randomization and delivering the anti-smoking message? So I don't know if anyone else has had this problem. So we are, we're struggling with our cl clinical trials office where we'll see a patient in clinic and then we're being told that they need 48 hours to randomize someone, which then means the patient has to leave, come back, and, and I'm sure everyone may have this problem. I mean, a large portion, portion of our patient population drives one to two to three hours to come see us. So that makes it just completely impossible to participate in this. And so I'm just wondering if anybody else had that problem and, and how they've dealt with it. I really just need some advice or uh, I guess feedback that nobody else is dealing with this problem and everybody else can randomize within half an hour um, and, and then to stick it to our clinical trials office um, <laughs> to, to be able to say that their, their current standard is kind of ridiculous. So I don't know if anyone else has had has that Has anyone issue. had that issue? Has anyone tried to open this? Who's in the audience? Anyone want to speak to their experience? Go ahead, Matt, first. Uh, no, I don't. I, I can't help. Uh, to, I don't know. However, we're, it's not clear to us. Can it just be a suspicious nodule? Yes. Yes. Because we didn't get a straight answer on that. Yeah. No. The straight answer is it can be uh, um, known or suspected so lung that cancer. Because at the last alliance meeting, Ivana said, "Oh, we didn't think about that," and mm -hmm. she was looking to change it. So I don't know if it's changed. No, she's she has changed that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Because on clinicaltrials.gov right now, it doesn't say that. Um, yeah, the paperwork might not have okay. followed that, but we, we, we met even just in the last week about all these issues, and I, I think okay. there's resolution for all of them, including that issue. Um, whether or not that's fully reflected in all the downloadable protocols uh, yet okay. may not be the case, but the, the way it's going to be changed is to either a known or suspected diagnosis of lung cancer. So if, if you don't have a tissue diagnosis and you're taking that patient to the operating room to do a wedge for diagnosis first, you can, you can still enroll them on study. And you know, the other issue, and I don't see, we haven't, I think we're about to activate it. We haven't yet, so I haven't tried randomizing. But there's something to do with the timing of them collecting salivary cotinine levels and those time intervals are not necessarily in sync with when we would normally see patients and we're sort of trying to figure out how we're going to get those from patients if they're at like 6, 12, 18 weeks. They're not times of visits and, and a lot of us have patients come a long distance. We're pretty sure they're not going to drive five hours to spit into a cup. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was questions about could they mail it in and I feel like some of those details weren't fully fleshed out yet. I don't know where Ivana is with that. Yeah, so just, just to speak to that, so the the Graham Warren, I think it is, the, his lab was actually going to be doing the analysis on the studies. So they, they have agreed to actually be able to mail the kits to people at home so you can actually do them at home rather than it being through a mandated visit. Because I agree with you, it's not, there was a whole bunch of visits there that just were, were going to be a big drag on accrual without that getting fixed. Dennis, we, yeah. we came, uh, we came uh, across a problem that having the medications delivered uh, without a, a patient's name for randomization. Is there anybody else? Care Sorry, say that again, Mikey? We couldn't get the drug unless we could name the patient beforehand. So randomization has become an issue. Okay, I Placebo hadn't heard that versus, one. Yeah. Okay. So that was, because of that, it's on hold. I was just talking about 
Phil Carrick, who's our PI, local PI, and uh, Phil's just saying we were having the same issue, but we're, we're working with our pharmacy on that to try and make that, but, but we're struggling with that also. So I, li I like to hear from what solutions. So, so do, is that a local issue, or do you th is that a trial issue? Here, I'll, I'll let Phil answer. Sure. The, um, the local uh, pharmacy that, that deals with the drug and their ability to get it into the patient's hands the same day. And they initially didn't think they could do that, but now we're you know, trying to, to get them to be a little more agile and okay. dealing with it. So. Okay. Well, it, again, all of these issues, if they continue to be drags on accrual, let us know. Because, um, again, you know, NCI's made the commitment they're going to do this. They've cut the check. So it's our responsibility now to try and put patients on study and see if we can get this done. And if there are issues like that that really are drags on accrual, let us know and we'll do our best to try and get it fixed.